Welcome, everybody. It is an absolute pleasure to be joined by so many new, fresh citizens, fresh off the production line. Now, bear with me. There is a lot of information to take in here, and I know this is going to be complicated and confusing, so let's start at the beginning. This is the city. For most of you, it is all you will ever experience. It stretches to infinity. All that you see and everything around you is part of the city. It forms a tiny part of it. You are all part of something very special. You see, the city is governed by an all-powerful AI, and legend has it that many generations ago it was our ancestors who designed and coded this system. They made it to bring order from chaos, to organize us, and to make us better citizens. And that's what it does. It's transformed our world and augmented us. It's improved all of us. It designed and manages the city that we live in, and it structures our lives and connects all of us. The AI is called global. Kind of appropriate, because like the city, it is everywhere. You have all been programmed to recognize this logo and to feel a sense of loyalty and allegiance when you see it. Some of you, the conditioning may not have kicked in yet. Just watch yourselves. You can think of global as your mentor, your father figure, your best friend. It sees and knows everything. It keeps records of everything. It does this to better understand you, and that's okay. To protect you, sometimes to protect you from yourselves. It's watching and listening right now. You see, the AI's job is to decide how the city's finite resources are distributed. Because whilst the city is infinite, our resources aren't. We only have so much space, we have overpopulation, there are limited opportunities, and our environment is degrading. So we as citizens can't just sit back and do nothing. As responsible people, we have to earn our food and our shelter and our opportunities. So the system decides what everybody gets. And it does this using a series of sophisticated algorithms based on who it thinks deserves those resources the most. So how does it work? The core of the approach is to reward what it calls wellness. Wellness is essentially a high level of physical and mental fitness. You see, a well society is healthier, more productive, more successful. Individual wellness is a good indicator for survivability. It helps us become happy, well-adjusted, successful citizens. A well society is a successful society, has higher outputs, lower risk of disease and issues. Global measures our wellness and makes decisions on our behalf. You see, each day, the AI grades you on your wellness and places you on a list. It's like a league table, and all of us are in it. You get a number from one to, well, infinity. We know that behind that number and that process, there are infinitely complicated, complicated processes. We don't get to see any of that. It's too complicated for us to understand. The people at the top of the list get the most rewards. They get access to resources. They get better food, better salaries, healthcare, longer holidays, better living environments. They're happier healthier and more successful. So the question we all spend all of our time and all of our lives asking is how do I rank higher in the results? <laughs> this consumes us. It's all we focus on day to day. We are obsessed and addicted. It can be the difference between life and, well, a less pleasant life. The people at the top reap all of the rewards. The people lower down have to make do with scraps. The AI defines wellness in the form of three unchanging laws set in stone. And it gives us those laws it wants us to understand so that we can be better citizens. It believes that by following these rules, we will rise up the rankings and become better people. So what are the rules? The first law, learn this well, is that you must be healthy. You must eat a balanced diet. You must exercise regularly. You must be strong and fast and flexible. And you must be fit in mind and body. We'll explore these in more depth later. The second law, learn this well. You will be tested at the end. You must be creative. You must be innovative and stand out to surprise and delight your peers. You must write or play music or art or some other form of creative outlet that generates value. You must challenge how other people think and behave so that collectively we all become better. And you must create a legacy 
Something more than just you and your life today that lives beyond you, that adds value beyond your meager time in the city. The third law is that you must be popular. You must be well-known and well-liked. You must meet and engage with new people. You must maintain a healthy and diverse network. And you must be talked about, wanted and loved by other people. This is a lot, and excelling in these areas is a huge amount of work. This consumes our lives. It's hard to balance all of these things. It takes time and effort and focus. These aren't things that you can tick off on a checklist. You've got to work at these areas day in, day out. Even when you're high in the list, <clears throat> you have to keep working on these things. And you see, we don't know how well we're doing in each of these categories. We only get our scores in the ranking, so we have to make educated guesses about where we're stronger or weaker. That, focuses, that forces all of us to improve in all of the areas. It's a very clever system. Now, I appreciate all of this might feel overwhelming. Don't worry. Today's orientation is the first step in your journey to becoming fit, healthy citizens. The important thing to remember throughout all of this is this is a perfect system. You must trust it. It's grading you for your own good. It perfectly assesses everybody's wellness and grades them accordingly. It never makes mistakes and, coincidentally, there is no process for manual appeal because there's no need for manual appeal. It's a perfect system. And it even adapts to change. When we talk about the laws and the system, that's an oversimplification. These aren't static, immutable things. The laws don't change much, but the way in which the system interprets them does and evolves over time. If everybody in society becomes more creative, then the barrier rises for how creative you have to be in turn. We are all competing against and with each other. This constant tiny rebalancing of circa 3,200 changes a year, it happens on a level we can't begin to comprehend or understand. And as the world becomes more complex, so too does the system. It's even starting to predict the future. We don't know the implications of this, we don't understand this is new, this is only just happening. But it's built up so much data on how we behave and what wellness looks like that collectively and as individuals it's starting to know what we want and what we're going to do before we do. It knows how we're going to behave and it can take action and grade us accordingly. This is important to understand because whilst the system is perfect, we are not. Us poor, flawed individuals. You see, the original system made one critical mistake. It failed to anticipate that we wouldn't just follow the laws. The original designs didn't anticipate how selfish or how irrational we might be or that just rewarding good behaviour might not be enough. Even though healthier, happier people are more productive and rank higher and all the studies we have show that just improving your wellness improves your happiness, people don't act rationally. They lie, they cheat, they cut corners. For example, some people spend huge amounts of time trying to reverse engineer their grades. They ask, why do I rank in this position and not that position? Or why have I dropped two positions today? Despite being told that just focusing on their wellness and following the laws will help them improve. They try to work out how and why the system is grading them. They compare notes with others, minutely analysing what they did or didn't do. They try to test which behaviours impact their rankings in certain ways and which levers affect it. Often these people rank poorly because the time and energy they spend trying to reverse engineer why they rank poorly should have been better spent ranking better. Or they're just counting and analysing and measuring numbers from the outside of the system that maybe the system isn't even using. We cannot begin to comprehend how global analyses and ranks us. We can only see the outside of the system. Some people cheat and they try to trick the machine. They do things like they pay people to talk about them in an attempt to make them look more popular. Or they get, people, they get other people to create public works of art on their behalf and showcase their work as their own. Or they try to hide their levels of fitness by taking illegal drugs and supplements. You see, the truth is many people cheat a little bit. They say everybody else does, so I have to as well. I have to compete. And for many people it becomes normal and okay to tell these kinds of small lies. Most of the time, they get away with it. The design doesn't notice, or the system doesn't care enough to penalise them one at a time, because if everybody's doing it, then that becomes not, it doesn't feed back into the system well. Some of them do get caught and punished, and sometimes severely. They drop down the list, but hopefully they learn their lessons. 
Some people spend all their time complaining that the system is unfair. They claim that when you're at the top, it's easier to stay at the top because you have more time and more money and more resources to invest in your wellness or in cheating. More time to consider and study and evaluate the system and those others who are winning and to learn what they're doing. You see, it's hard to be popular if you're not creative. And it's hard to be creative if you're not exposed to new stimulus. And all these things are tied together. If you're lower down the list, you might struggle to dedicate enough resources to competing. Some say that the system is evil. They say that it's unethical, that the system doesn't care for individuals, only for the system itself, and that the list matters more than those in it. They say that it doesn't care who wins, it only cares that the best rise to the top, and it doesn't matter who gets hurt or loses out in the process. They say that the system exists only to feed itself, to grow and sprawl, and to consume all of our resources to replace us and to devour our world. Of course, this is propaganda by dissidents and malcontents and we should ignore their conspiracy theories. If only these people had spent all of their energy and time investing in improving their wellness. Don't worry. Obviously it goes without saying that you are all going to be fine, well, productive citizens. There is no need to worry or to fear the system. Just focus on doing good work and following the three laws and everything will be fine. However, not everybody is as well behaved as you. Even though we're all trying to follow the rules and become better citizens, the disruptive opinions and behaviours of others sometimes ruin things for everyone. So the system introduced a fourth law. It needed a way to regulate and manage bad behaviour so it didn't impact the good citizens amongst you. The fourth law is that you must act with integrity. You must be completely honest and transparent in all of your dealings with the system. You must not attempt to deceive the system. Trust that the system knows best and deceiving the system may lead to punishment. Don't worry. Mostly the system just quietly adjusts the rankings of offenders. Sometimes it will make an example out of people, somebody in high society who's been caught cheating. Occasionally, very rarely, groups of serious offenders will be banished from the city and are never seen again. I know what you're thinking. It's okay. It's not like the system became some kind of evil AI monster. It still wants what's best for us and to help us to become our best selves. But it had to have a way to regulate the system. It had to manage the whole system overall when people don't act fairly or rationally. If you follow the three laws, you will be fine. Anyway, the system prefers rehabilitation to punishment. Most of the time it's not economical for it to penalise every small infraction. The system wants us to be better people, so it's in its interest to educate us rather than to penalise us. So it offers us lifestyle advice. It tells us not to obsess about where we are in the list, to not even think about the list and just get on with our day-to-day -day lives, to be happy and carefree. It gives us, gives us advice and sets down guidelines that we can follow. It even provides us with envoy droids. They tell us that they're here to answer questions and to help and they engage with us because we're not able to communicate directly with the system. It's too sophisticated, too abstract, too complicated. We're small and insignificant in comparison. We need intermediaries to translate for us. It's Danny Sullivan on the left. <laughs> if you, oh, they're not here today. I should have updated this slide. The last time I did this, they were in the room and they were delightfully uncomfortable. Off the record, <laughs> they're independent systems too. And we're not sure they can communicate clearly with the AI. So we get good general advice and lifestyle guidance, but it tends to be generalised. Rarely specific individual recommendations and rarely for specific sites. And sometimes it is increasingly unclear what their agenda is, whether they're working to help us or to manage us. And perhaps sometimes they don't even know, worth bearing in mind. Shift gear a bit. I want to take you through a case study of what following the three laws looks like and what being a successful well citizen looks like. Um, we have um, a special guest in the room that I'm really excited to introduce. Um, we include this case study in all of our inductions. Um, it's about a very special individual and his journey. He's here today. Where is Andrew? Over in the corner. Round of applause for Andrew. That's his we're going to talk about, standard, there he is. We're going to talk about, um, it's very brave of him to allow us to tell his story today. This is his journey on um, a, a way to become a better citizen. Um, it's a story about how important it is to invest time in the right places and the right types of things and what happens when people start to see their rankings drop and how they react and how you can best manage that. It's a story about why it's so important to follow the laws. Now, some of you might not know this, but many, many of you know that Andrew contributes to society 
through stand-up comedy. This is his creativity, and it's the thing he does in order to find a place in the city. We all have our gifts and our roles. Mine is educating you today, his is entertaining. Yours, you will find out when you finish this course, that's exciting. Um, <laughs> he's not the best comedian. He's okay. He used to be quite popular back in the day, like way of once upon a time. He produces relatively good content, which his audiences generally seem to enjoy, but more recently, things started to go wrong. You see, his rankings, once relatively high, had started to decline. Fewer people were coming to his events. His reviews had become less positive and less frequent, and he started to panic. He leads a good, productive life. He's relatively healthy and popular and creative, but he got complacent. Now, there are younger, healthier, more creative, more popular people than him. Their content was more relevant to their audience more engaging, better crafted, fresher. So his peers started to outrank him. It's not that he'd got worse. This is critical to understand. He didn't do anything wrong. It's just other people got better and the system reevaluated. His problem was he just kept on doing what he'd always been doing. The same old content delivered in the same old way to changing audiences who wanted something new. He'd never been a perfect citizen, but he'd been a good one, and until recently, that had been enough to rank reasonably well. But the world and the people he was competing with had changed, and he hadn't. And he didn't want to change. He didn't want to change the way he'd always done things. It had worked until now, and he was comfortable. So he resented the system. Why should he do all this extra effort and do all these extra things in order to achieve the rank he'd already had? Why had it been taken away? He'd never really stood back and considered that the good fortune he'd had through all this time was because the system had been rewarding him, and it was never his in the first place. To improve, he realized he would have to change. He didn't have a choice, so he put time in. He would have to put time into becoming better, weller, to increasing his rank and his uh, overall sophistication. But remember, the system doesn't tell us which areas we're stronger or weaker in. He didn't know specifically where he was falling short. As he thought about it, where's he gone? I've upset him so much. He's, well, he came up with this. He's gone. Came up with some ideas about what well, he's going to well, We may as well just go home. Um, I can talk about him now. See, the problem was he was a bit out of shape. His content was stale and he was becoming less popular. Because he was already behind the curve, he wanted to find things he could do quickly and easily to boost his place in the rankings. So he studied the three laws and he came up with a plan, starting with the first. You remember this, you were all here just now. He had to get fitter, healthier, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that sounds like a shit ton of work. That's really, really hard. Lots to think about, lots to schedule, lots of things to do daily. Big, scary lifestyle choices. But he'd give it a go, and maybe he could find some quick wins. So he audited his health. He went for a checkup. The doctors and nutritionists helped him analyze in great detail everything that was wrong with him. And they looked at his lifestyle choices and his overall health. They produced a list that told him how he, was, how he was doing and identified all of the issues he had. He hoped that he could quickly find out some things he could change, re re reconcile and, and fix the things that caused his drop in rankings. Maybe he could cut something out of his diet or eat more fiber or do more exercise or something he could understand, something tangential, tangential, tangible. <laughs> the challenge was there was no magic bullet. There, there wasn't just a single easy thing he could just do and fix. There were hundreds of tiny tweaks he needed to make and to keep making every day. And it was a bit overwhelming. The problem wasn't there was one magic bullet that needed fixing. The problem was that he had loads of small bugs. The main thing the audit found was that he, his unhealthy lifestyle meant that he was always a little bit ill. A sniffle that wouldn't go away, general fatigue, aching muscles. You see, his lack of attention to small daily self-care concerns meant that this list of things had built up over time. The idea of fixing all of those things was overwhelming and he didn't know where to start. And as he looked around at other people, he saw that many of them suffered from the same kinds of bugs. They were eating too many donuts, they weren't exercising enough, they all had sniffles and weight aches, and all of them were full of small bugs. So he wasn't really motivated to address any of those issues, the big, scary, underlying causes of those problems. If other people weren't nailing it, maybe he could get away with slacking off as well. But it wasn't just his health that was impacted by these bugs. Because he had all of these issues, nobody really wanted to spend time with him or to consume his content. It was unpleasant to engage with him. Even on his better days, the good content he did share went unnoticed because people didn't like him. His bugs impacted not only his health, but his popularity and his creativity. You see, he was fundamentally unfit. 
Because he had all these bugs, it made it much harder for him to keep up. Not only was he already falling behind, he lacked the motivation and energy and capability to catch up and to compete. So the content he was producing wasn't interesting and engaging his audience, which meant he wasn't getting the press coverage and the word of mouth attention that he needed to succeed. He was trapped in a cycle of failure. Oh dear. <laughs> One night, a man introduced himself after a particularly unsuccessful gig and said, his name was Mr. Gray. He said that he could turn things around for Andrew. He said he would be willing, willing to write new content for him. He said that he had clients in the same industry and he writes all of their content and those clients are pretty successful. And Andrew knew anecdotally that many people did in fact quietly use such types of services in order to produce their content. And whilst he knew it wasn't necessarily the best quality, it was certainly easier and perhaps cheaper than him spending hours and hours of his own time doing the work. So he thought back to the second law, which was that he must be creative. Even thinking about this and the amount of work involved scared him, especially when he was already struggling with the first law. He thought, I don't have the time or the health or the network to even start to tackle any of this. So he thought maybe he could invest a bit of money with Mr. Black. Mr. Black, Mr. Gray, Mr. Gray. <laughs> help him cut some corners and get back on his feet. It wouldn't be forever, but it would help him fast track his recovery. And in the meantime, he could assess his diet and his health and his social life and all these other areas. So he paid Mr. Gray to write him some content. He commissioned a number of new pieces to add to his repertoire. It didn't cost much and it was certainly easier than him doing it himself. What he got back was okay. Not as good as his best work, but it was all right. And when he started using his new material and pushing his new content, it did okay. Even though he was still sick and people struggled to find and consume his content, an influx of new okay content had helped him attract new audiences and his rankings improved a little. Good work. But then, Things went wrong. You see, adding new content had helped him seem more relevant initially, but it just wasn't on topic. You see, Andrew's audience is like everybody is unique and they have particular needs and tastes and preferences. And he intrinsically understands that. It's what made him successful in the first place. The generic content that Mr. Gray produced was thin, duplicated from other comedians' work, not really tailored and didn't take that uniqueness into consideration. The quality was low, the content was generic, and the messaging was uninteresting. His rankings dropped even further than they were before. Audiences left quickly. They weren't impressed by his content and they didn't recommend him to their friends. And of course the system saw all of this. It understood that the content he was producing wasn't relevant to his audience. He'd made things worse by cutting corners. He wasn't being creative. And his content didn't stand out. He'd produced material his audience didn't want to consume. He hadn't considered their needs, only his own. And critically, other people and his competitors had. They'd thought about their audiences and what makes them unique and how to connect that. And they'd done a much better job and ranked higher. Mr. Gray insisted the problem wasn't the content. He complained, but he said the content was fine. The problem was that he didn't have an agent, somebody who could get him connections, could promote him, could introduce him to the right people and build his popularity. He said that he could get him more industry links. He told him that if he had better connections with more influential popular people, more people might come and see his content. If he could get loads of people to recommend and endorse him, it would make his content seem much better, makes sense. And of course, Mr. Gray could provide such a service for a cost. He said that it was perfectly normal to use an agent to build links. And Andrew knew that most of the most, so many of the most successful people and, um, did have people who promote them on their behalf, who recommend them, who introduce them, who connect them to journalists. And that certainly sounded much easier than spending hours and hours of his own time attending networking events and building legitimate human relationships and doing the hard work, especially when he was busy trying to manage his health and his content and do all these other things. So he thought back to the third law, which was that he must be popular. He knew that he needed to build a reputation and to build an audience if he was going to succeed. He needed the attention of journalists and more successful people than him because recommendations cascade down. And even though he was sick, and even though people still struggled with his content, and even though he didn't really have anything interesting to say to those audiences, he paid Mr. Gray in exchange for getting him some industry links. He got introductions to influential journalists, peers, and influencers. And he, he told them all about himself. He described what he does, he shared some of his content, and he pitched to them about how they should review and talk about him. And whilst they listened to his introductions, nothing came of it. You see, he didn't listen to them and he didn't listen to their needs. He just talked about himself. 
The conversation was entirely about him and not at all about them. Mr. Gray said the problem wasn't the links, the problem was that they should do something bigger and bolder. Instead of trying to network with influencers one at a time, especially when he had all these problems with his health and with his content, he should try a big campaign, paper over the cracks, go big or go broke. They'd host it at a different venue, one which gets a bigger, albeit more general audience, and they'd do something big for awareness. They'd try and get loads of eyeballs on his content in the hopes that some people might then join his regular audience. He invested a fortune in an enormous PR campaign. It was a hit. The content he launched was funny, accessible, everybody said they loved it. He got phone calls from journalists, loads of new industry links, and it made him hugely popular. For a moment, for one night, everyone was talking about Andrew's content. His rankings shot up. Good work. By the next day, people had moved on. And because the content wasn't a good fit for his audience, and because it was hosted somewhere else, it hadn't really fixed anything. His core audience hadn't increased. People still didn't like his core content. He was still sick. His popularity faded and the system saw all of this. And it understood that perhaps he hadn't earned those links. Perhaps he hadn't earned that attention. And it knocked his rankings back down. Rightly so, he started to wonder if he was getting some bad advice. So he hired a private investigator to look into Mr. Gray and it turned out that the content he'd been provided had just been taken copied and adapted from other peoples. And it turned out that he'd paid for industry links and coverage from people who professionally sell industry links and coverage. None of it was authentic. The people he'd paid were dubious characters at best, and of course, Global in its infinite wisdom had seen and understood all of this, and that all of that coverage and all of that attention shouldn't count towards his rankings. You see, he fundamentally wasn't popular. He'd bought and rented temporary attention. He hadn't made people like him. He hadn't improved the core proposition and the thing he is and was and does. Nothing had changed. He just papered over the cracks. He created a brief flash of attention, but nothing meaningful or lasting, certainly not a legacy. His competitors were naturally getting talked about all the time because of the good content they're producing and because of how fit and healthy and easy to discover they were. And through all of this, he'd lost precious time, resources and energy that could have been spent on improving himself. So when he approached Mr. Gray again, he told him he wasn't interested. He told Mr. Gray to leave him alone and to never talk to him again. But Mr. Gray said there was one last thing they should try. He said that there were rumors of other places outside the city beyond the wastelands, other cities, other systems, other ways of living and working. Worlds, worlds, worlds governed by different rules where some, in some places you didn't need to worry about the three laws. Worlds where goo Google didn't say Google. World, world's <laughs> where global um, doesn't see and monitor and measure everything. And it's easier to get away with these kinds of corner cutting tactics. Now, Mr. Gray said it might mean that his audiences were a bit smaller and there might be some risks involved, but he would happily help him migrate. Of course, this is nonsense. I've told you, you already know, the city is infinite. The si global is all seeing and all knowing. There is nothing beyond global's reach. Andrew was appalled that he spent so much time and money with this obviously madman and told him as much. He told him he never wanted to hear from him again and left. Things were looking bad. Oh. He was unhealthy, he was uncreative, and he was unpopular. His rankings were lower than they'd ever been and he didn't have a plan. So he sat down and thought about everything he'd done and everything he'd learned. He had a light bulb moment, a moment of revelation. You see, his problem was that he'd only been thinking about himself. He'd been obsessing about his health and how it affected the, him, not those around him. He'd been thinking about how he could create content without spending hours of his time and his energy, rather than thinking about how he could create content that solved the needs and problems of his audience. He'd been thinking about how he could get other people to talk about him, rather than how he could be interesting and friendly and approachable. You see, the secret to getting all of this right is no secret. It's to think about not yourself and your content and your popularity, but your impact on others. It's much easier to be popular if you listen to what your audience wants, how they feel and what their concerns are before you talk about yourself. It's much easier to be creative if you tailor what you're producing to fit gaps in the market rather than minimizing your effort. It's much easier to do all of this if you're fitter and healthier and not full of bugs. So we went on a diet. He started exercising more, he's looking good. 
Um, he started fixing his small bugs. He referred back to the results of his audit and he started addressing all of those little problems. There were still hundreds of things he needed to do and to keep doing every day. But if he tackled just a couple at a time, he would make progress. He started to feel better. He noticed that people were finding it easier to discover his content. Fewer people left his shows immediately. His reviews improved. This is not rocket science. Managing his health on a day-to-day -day basis became part of his routine and something he thought about regularly. His rankings started to increase. He started writing new content designed to appeal to his audience. He thought about and researched what they were interested in. He talked to them, surveyed them, learned about the problems they had and the things they wanted to see, and understood the connection between that and his own special experience and capabilities. He looked at the content other people were creating, and he found gaps and opportunities to do his own stuff. He kept reviewing and improving the content he had. He iterated and refined and improved day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. His rankings increased further. Fundamentally, he changed, I keep saying fundamentally, he changed how he was talking to influencers and made sure that he was adding value to those conversations. He listened and learned what people were talking about. He looked for existing conversations he could join where he could help people and add value without just talking about himself. As he did this more and more often, he found that people started to reference him as a source of advice. The people he was helping started to recommend him, sending people to see his content. He reached new, broader audiences and people he would never have just, never been able to reach just through self-promotion. His rankings started doing really well. Now he's on the road to recovery. He's doing really well. His rankings are back where, before, where they were before. He is a wonderful success case. Let's have a round of applause for Andrew and his very, very challenging journey. Good work. Good work, good work, good work. So that's the end of our story and of this induction. I hope it was useful. Um, we have some closing thoughts. None of these principles or learnings are particularly complex, but they do require ongoing continual hard work and that you think about the needs of others rather than just yourself. Andrew took, Andrew's journey took the hard way and the long way. He learned through failure and lost precious time in the process. The good news is you don't have to learn through failure. Minor plug you have access to a life coach. <laughs> Step out of character briefly. I work for a company called Yoast. Um, if you run your website on WordPress or Drupal or Magento and any, any number of other things, you will recognize this logo. We are an SEO plugin. Um, I mention that not to pitch, but because we are also very involved in um, the open web, the evolution of standards. We work very closely with Google, Facebook, Wikipedia, others to help shape what the web becomes and what it means to write content and how influencer marketing works and all of that. Um, we're very pro open source and these conversations all happen out in the open. If you would like to be part of that and to help shape what the web becomes. Um, I'm really keen to talk to you later on in the evening because this is our mission. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to help people to not have to worry about all this crap. In an ideal world, SEO shouldn't require that you micromanage your website and obsess about which keyword you're trying to rank which page for. All of that is a dysfunction of Google's current model. In an ideal world, you should have a great product and great customer service and reputation, and you should be discovered as a result. That's what we're trying to create gradually, one piece at a time, um, through our collaboration with Google, through WordPress, through a whole bunch of other places. Um, in the meantime, um, use our plugin on whatever you're using and stop worrying about at least half of that. Like the thing we do phenomenally well is get all of the technical stuff right, stop you having to obsess about micromanaging it and help you facilitate that. So plug aside, it's time for all of you to go out into the city to enjoy your new roles as citizens. Congratulations on passing um, Induction 101. Go out and remember global is watching. Good luck. Thank you.